discovery in a local junkyard upends a small New Mexico town. The face was all skeleton. The individual in the toolbox had been deceased for a while. The pathologist was able to retrieve a small business card inside his shirt pocket. It was her name. He was described as a generous man who just kind of kept to himself. Investigators zero in on a well-known troublemaker with family ties. He was a loose cannon. The reason why we're here, we've got a warrant for your arrest, okay? All right. He was always getting into trouble with the law. Police report! Have you ever seen a, a, a big toolbox around the property? Yeah, there was a demand. But the investigation will ultimately expose an unimaginable betrayal even closer to home. His health was declining. She would help him clean and cook. She was supposed to be taking care of him. I know. It looks so delicious and just horrible. Do you think you got to snap that nail open? No, I snapped that thing so good. October 15th, 2020, Chad Abeda, his father Louis, and Chad's young son are poking around a makeshift dump site behind their rental home. Only a handful of individuals had access to that trash pit. This town's so little we didn't have direct access to a dump all the time, so we kind of had to make do with what we had. They observed a toolbox or tool chest that looked really nice. This type of tool chest normally goes behind a pickup truck. They were like, oh wow, it's a pretty nice toolbox. I mean, I could have used for this. When Chad moves to lift the toolbox, it won't budge. It was so heavy that he couldn't pull it out himself. So they ended up getting some straps and they pulled it out together. When they opened it up, there was blankets in there. When they were taking the blankets off, that's when they saw the skull. They're all like, man, back up. We're, we're dealing with something else here. That's quickly by New Mexico State Police. Based off the decomposition of the body, it looks like the individual in the toolbox had been deceased for a while. Based off the facial hair, the clothing, it appeared to be a male. The skeleton remains had duct tape wrapped around its mouth. It also had duct tape wrapped around its wrist. As soon as I saw the tape, I knew at that point in time, we're done with the homicide. The medical examiner is called to the scene to collect the remains. There wasn't any identification on him except there was a medical card. The pathologist was able to retrieve a small business card for a doctor's office with an appointment inside his shirt pocket with the name A.J. Harding. The toolbox with the body inside was then transported to the Office of Medical Examiner. We did not have 100% confirmation, but we had a name. So we're trying to find out who was E.J. Harden. Born April 2nd, 1938, A.J. Harden grew up in Fort Sumner. After a stint in the Navy, he married the love of his life, Virginia. It was your classic 1960s American marriage. They would take good care of each other. It was very loving. AJ worked in the lumber industry, cutting branches. And after that, he was a truck driver, and he worked across the country. They moved back to Wellington, Texas, where Virginia's family is from. They had three children, Shane, Tommy, and Candy. Tragically, Shane passed away in his childhood. In the early 2000s, they moved back to Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Once they lived in Fort Sumner, they started a hamburger stand. AJ, Virginia, and Kenny Sr. all helped with the hamburger stand. Eventually, their children grew up and started families of their own. 
In 1982, their youngest daughter, Candy, welcomed a son, Aaron, followed by a daughter, Candy Jo. Virginia and AJ were thrilled to be grandparents. They loved having their family around them, and Virginia loved having everybody there in her home for every holiday. But Candy struggled with motherhood. Candy Sr. tried to maintain the relationship with Aaron and Candy Joe's father. That didn't work out. He was not involved whatsoever. In the 90s, Candy started to also struggle with addiction. Candy Sr. had some demons, and she really took Candy Joe. He pretty much grew up with his grandparents, AJ and Virginia. Candy lived with her mother off and on throughout her younger years, and when she wasn't living with her mother, AJ and Virginia provided a roof over their head. Candy Jo flourished under the care of her grandparents. She was the shining star of the family. Candy Jo, she wanted to play volleyball in college. She wanted to get a degree. Aaron, on the other hand, battled his own demons, and he soon left his grandparents' home. Aaron always kind of been the wild one. Aaron was always getting into trouble with the law. He had been caught breaking and entering, and it was always a worry to Candy. She never fully trusted him. As Aaron slipped away, Candy Joe's mother entered recovery and came back into her life. Candy Sr. was very proud of Candy Joe. She was that bull for eye. She could do no wrong. In those preteen and teen years, Candy, Joe, and Candy Sr. started developing a relationship, a better relationship than they had when she was a child. In 2012, Candy Joe graduated from high school. With her family's support behind her, she was poised for success. She had a full ride to the University of the Southwest to play volleyball. She was probably the first family member to go to college. But in the middle of her freshman year, Candy Joe's world came crashing down when her mother passed away from a sudden illness. She took a break from school and returned to her grandparents' home on Lake Fort Sumner. Despite her doing all these correct things and following through, life kept taking things away from her. Back in Fort Sumner, Candy Joe caught the eye of 27-year-old Sean Perkins. We met at a rodeo there in Fort Sumner. But we kind of developed a relationship through our life goals. We didn't know our place in life quite yet, and we kind of strived to figure that out with each other. AJ and Virginia are very kind and generous. They welcomed me like family. Once me and Candy Joe started dating, it wasn't too long before we moved in with each other. And Kenny and I learned that we are having a child kind of unexpectedly, and uh, we let family know. And AJ and Virginia were very excited, um, so were my parents. But what should have been a joyous time soon turned tragic in the spring of 2016. Age started creeping up on AJ, and Virginia had Crohn's disease, and she was a little iller. Grandmother was the sole person in the family. AJ was heartbroken, but he was very spiritual in that he knew this wasn't going to be the last that he's going to see her. Another blow came following the birth of Candy Joe's daughter in 2016 when AJ was diagnosed with cancer. Candy Joe would spend the majority of her time taking care of our daughter and her grandfather. Eventually, the pressure proved to be too much for the couple. Candy started pushing us away. She shifted into the party crowd. It felt like her interest wasn't being a mom anymore at the time. And the void between us grew and grew. By 2019, the relationship was beyond repair. I packed up both me and my daughter. I thought it would be in the best interest for me to get custody due to me being the stable one. She agreed. Sean and his mother moved in together a couple of towns over from Fort Sumner while Candy Jo returned to the home of her grandfather. She did mention his health and how it was declining and Candy didn't know how much longer she was going to have with him. 
She would help him clean, cook. AJ was very, very happy that she was there. But on October 15th, 2020, it appears AJ's end has come sooner than expected when his potential remains are found in a trash pit. Given that the body had likely been there for weeks, the chances of finding anything useful are slim. When you're doing a crime scene, you never really know what is exactly important, so you're taking pictures of everything and you're looking at everything. We did see a trailer there. And on that trailer, it had a flat tire. We didn't know whether this has something to do with the investigation or it doesn't. We thought, was this the trailer that was used to haul out the tool chest? From the minute that we saw the trailer, it just looked like anything else. But at the same time, it was still out of place for us. Investigators turn to the family of Chad Abeda, the man who found the body and lives on the property. While Chad did not witness the trailer's arrival, he says his son did. Weeks ago, he had observed a white pickup truck all in a trailer, and they left the trailer there. He was unsure of whoever was driving the white pickup truck. The trash pit was accessible to anyone that knew it was back there, but it was not visible from the road. One of the questions that I asked the beta is, and their answer was, if they do have access, they have to get permission from the homeowner. The boy's mother chimes in. She tells investigators there is one name that comes to mind. Aaron Harden. She told us that the owner of the residence would allow Aaron Harden to go there and be a handyman, per se, clean the property up and allowing him access to the pit at any time. After learning about Aaron Harden, Michael talked to one of the, the deputies who was still on scene and asked him who is Aaron Harden. Turns out that Aaron Harden is, uh, he's a local. He does have his run-in with law enforcement every now and then. And that's when he told me A.J. Harden was Aaron's grandpa. Coming up, the search for Aaron Harden proves difficult. Did he decide to take off? Was he fleeing from us? And in an unexpected twist, is A.J. Harden actually alive? We were completely shocked. Was that A.J. inside the tool chest, or was he in a retirement home? After finding a toolbox containing human remains in a makeshift dump site, New Mexico authorities believe they may belong to 83-year-old A.J. Harden. In the front pocket of the shirt was a doctor's card. It said next day appointment with the name of A.J. Harden. Investigators learn that A.J.'s 38-year-old grandson, Aaron Harden, is known to use the trash pit. Aaron Harden had dumped trash there previously. He did chores there. I see the one that placed the trailer out there. Is he the one that took the tool chest out there? That was a lead. After locating Aaron's last known address, investigators head to his home. We met with a man who was the owner of the residence who lived with Aaron. We told him that we were looking for Aaron, and he told us that he wasn't there, that he was currently in Arizona. Did he decide to take off? Was he fleeing from us? In the midst of trying to track Aaron down, they get an update from the autopsy. They could not determine the cause of death due to the fact that the body was so deteriorated. However, the ME is closer to confirming the victim's identity. The doctor did observe a hip replacement. His hip replacement had a serial number on it. While awaiting confirmation, from medical records, investigators work off the assumption that A.J. Harden... We don't jeopardize the, the integrity of the investigation. The day after the autopsy, they reach out to the owner of the rental property where the body was found. The residence was actually owned by a lady named Brenda Moyer, uh, but she was renting it out to the Abetas. And so investigators went to speak with her. I asked Brenda, who's A.J. Harden? And she said that A.J. Harden was a very nice man. He's an older man. He's the grandpa to Candy Joe Webb 
and Aaron Harden. Brenda Moyer described Aaron to be a very nice guy. He helps her out around the house. He helps her throw out trash into that pit. And that's not the only connection she makes for detectives. Her son, Sean Perkins, had a daughter with Candy Jo Webb. Investigators ask to speak with Sean. Sean tells detectives that he and Candy Jo used to live in the home where the body was found and that Aaron often used the dump. We all kind of viewed Aaron. He was a loose cannon, if you will. It wasn't unusual for him to be gone for a period of time. When they ask Sean about AJ, he says that he and Candy Jo had a very special relationship. AJ unconditionally loved her. He was very happy that he was around his great-granddaughter. Sean reveals that a couple of months prior, in late August, Candy Jo made a difficult decision regarding her grandfather's care. Candy texted me, asking me, would it be a bad idea for my papa or AJ to go to a home? I told her that it's between you and him. So I texted her one day, I asked her, did you send AJ to a home? And she told me, yes, I did. We were completely shocked. Was that AJ inside the tool chest, or was he in a retirement home? Where is he? At that point, we wanted to interview Candy. Investigators place a call to Candy Jo on the spot. She agrees to meet them at Brenda's and arrives shortly after. Okay, so do you kind of know why we're here today? Or um, What they told me was that the body was found. I asked her if she knew who the person that was found inside that toolbox was. She told us she did not. Do you have any idea who would want to drop the body off of there or anything like that? I remember the renter saying that my brother had went out there like two or three weeks ago and threw stuff in the bed and didn't tell Brenda. When asked about her brother Aaron, she talks about how he is always in trouble. She doesn't directly say that he's involved with it, but she... Candy Jo says that she tried to keep her distance from Aaron, but he continued to come around the lake house. It used to be my grandpa's house. Um, the deed is in my name now. It has been for years. I had a no trespass order against him. The reason that she said she did the no trespass order is they just weren't getting along and she didn't want him around a property or her daughter. She was worried about him taking advantage of AJ and maybe even her. Detectives ask Candy Jo about her grandfather. Where's AJ at? In hospice care. I haven't talked to him about him in long. She stated that she had placed AJ Harden in a retirement facility just outside Willington, Texas. Candy Jo says the facility is about six hours away, but she can't recall the name. No. You, can always, I can, I can, you can always get it for us, right? So the fact that she doesn't remember where she dropped them off, big red flag, big red flag. As they wait for Candy Jo to find the name of the nursing home, investigators look into the no trespass order she took out on Aaron. She was very protective of AJ. He was that parental figure that she never really got. They find body cam footage from multiple visits to the lake house in the months prior, including an arrest over the summer for an unrelated charge. He was there to serve a simple misdemeanor arrest warrant. He knocked on the door. Someone opened the door and ended up being Mr. Agent Hart. We learned that Aaron was still living there at that time. Your dogs don't bite me. Are you sure? Aaron, you? Come on, I'm gonna talk to you right quick. Aaron came to the door. How you doing, man? What's up? He was extremely cooperative. So, the reason why we're here, we got a warrant for your arrest, okay? All right. So we're gonna have to take you in. During the course of uh, arresting Aaron, Lieutenant Ghana asked AJ how he was doing, and AJ disclosed that he was doing good. We know for a fact in the summer of 2020 that AJ was alive, and so that was extremely important. The footage also provides proof that Aaron and AJ appear to get along. I know she figured it was easy. 20 bucks. When he was uh, picked up on that arrest warrant, his grandpa even gave him some money before he left. 
On August 21st, Candy Joe took out the no trespass order. But records show that in the following weeks, Aaron continued to show up at AJ's lake house where he was met by police. I'll follow you there, Mr. Harden. He was trying to... I haven't been able to get a hold of my granddad, and that's what I'm after. In an attempt to mediate, the officer places a call to Candy Joe, but she doesn't back down. Don't get pissed off. She goes, well, he has his telephone number. He can call him when he's good and ready to call him. That's all she would tell me. She's a bitch, huh? When AJ kind of got diagnosed with cancer and it was apparent that the end is coming, he did his house over to Candy Joe because she was kind of the one family member that was probably the most stable. We were still trying to make contact with Aaron. We know that Candy doesn't want nobody to have access to AJ Harden, and we're still trying to find out the reason why. At this point, both of them are person of interest. Coming up, an unexpected twist. I could not find a retirement home in Texas called Shady Oaks anywhere. Her story's all over the place. A potential suspect hands over a lead. The toolbox was at your grandpa's house. She didn't want to come in without an attorney to speak, 
So upon the same day, we decided that we were going to locate Garrett Bean. On October 22nd, detectives arrive at the Bean residence. How you doing, brother? What's your name again? Garrett Bean. So you kind of say you know why we're here? Well, that's what I was hoping you guys would tell me more about it, because I'm kind of in the gray on this. They ask him about AJ, but his response, unexpected. Where's your grandpa? Her grandpa? Yeah. He passed. How did you know he passed? She had told me. Candy Whip had told him that Agent Harden had died in his sleep a couple months back. Okay, okay. apparently she has been lying to you. We disclosed AJ Harden did pass away, but it's not the way Candy Webb told him he passed away. AJ Harden's dead in that tool chest. I realized this was a lot more serious than I could have imagined, and I felt dumb at that point. I was just very blindsided. Thank you. Following the interview, it was reverberates through the small town. Both me and my mother were in disbelief of it all. We, we didn't understand what was going on. The news does prompt an unexpected phone call. Aaron Hardy contacts me. Aaron said he was currently in Arizona. So, I'm pretty sure you know what's going on. No, I don't. I don't know. This is what I know. Okay. That uh, my granddad is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Is passed away. He uh, learned that it was possibly his grandfather. I did tell him, yes, it's true. Did you have any issues with your granddad? Me and you, we were on good terms. The best of terms we've always been on. We've never had no problems. He tells investigators that the real reason Candy Joe had the no trespass order issued was because he'd confronted her about stealing from AJ. They learned that Aaron and AJ shared a bank account. The day that Aaron received a no trespass notice, he had discovered that Candy Joe Webb had been writing hot checks using the joint account that he shared with his grandfather. Cost me about $1,500 or $1,400 worth of hot checks. Aaron says Candy Joe obtained a no trespass order so he couldn't tell AJ. But investigators now wonder if it was because AJ was already dead. Have you ever seen a, a, a big toolbox around the property? Yeah, there was, it was in the shop. It's mine. Toolbox? Was that your grandpa's house? First, the, the last time I seen it, it was in the metal shed in the oh, backyard. Okay. When we executed the search on the residence days prior, we didn't see a tool chest there. So we were fairly confident that we at least established the origin of where the tool chest came from. We just felt like Aaron Harden was not involved. Just based on his interview, based on his the way he was explaining the love for his grandpa, how detailed he was. So there's just more evidence piling up that this was Candy Joe Webb who killed her grandfather. Coming up, a concerned source comes forward with a shocking new claim. She told me that he um, had asked her to do it. With her back against a wall, will Candy Joe tell the truth? Had those Louisiana and those other electors, and I gave them to it, but it wasn't. I didn't drag it. Discovering the remains of A.J. Harden, detectives have zeroed in on his granddaughter, Candy Jo Webb, as their main suspect. Contacts investigators again. Gary wanted to give another interview with us to establish that he wasn't involved. Garrett and his attorney meet with investigators on October 26th. Garrett says that following his first interview with police, he met with Candy Jo at a hotel you know at that point i didn't know what to believe what, what was true or what wasn't you know now i'm hearing a whole nother thing according to garrett candy joe said that aj had requested her help in ending his life she told me that he um, had asked her to do it she had given him xanax and ambien and he had passed in his sleep at that point she ended up putting him in a tool chest and getting rid of him Not only did Candy Joe tell him that she drugged AJ, 
Garrett now believes Candy Jo called him in late August as she was disposing of the body. While she was, you know, disposing of trash, she had FaceTimed me because the tire had blown out on the trailer. I had told her, wait for me and I'll help you. But she was very adamant about just getting it done right then. Once Garrett told us that now we knew that she used that trailer to haul the tourists with AJ's human remains in there to dump it out. Investigators believe Garrett. Coming forward with the information that he had, at that point we felt like he wasn't involved. He was uh, part of Candy Webb's lies like everybody else was, and we cleared him. With Garrett's statement, authorities have what they need. We're now confident that Candy did murder AJ, therefore we uh, set on an arrest warrant for her on October 28th. But when they attempt to serve it, Candy Joe is nowhere to be found. Candy was no longer in the area. At that time, Sergeant Hernandez reached out to the U.S. Marshals for assistance. Investigators seize phone and financial records to reconstruct Candy Joe's movements. I was able to get a search warrant for her cell phone and started pinging in different places in Bronzeville, Texas. From then, she went to McAllen, Texas, where she sold her grandfather's truck. We saw she was using a prepaid debit card at the time, and she bought a Greyhound ticket to go to Jacksonville, Florida. For seven days, authorities stay one step behind until she arrives in Jacksonville. Through her credit card charges, U.S. Marshals pinpoint the location where Candy has decided to hold up. That radius is around that hotel room. On November 5th, 2020, less than a month after the discovery of her grandfather's body, U.S. Marshals make their move. Candy Webb is coming out of one of those hotel rooms. So they follow her to a nearby convenience store gas station. They arrest her. Deputy Marshal that arrested her told me that she didn't even ask a single question. She was already expecting it. On December 1st, 2020, officers Hernandez and Villarreal interview Candy Joe in the Debaca County Adult Detention Center. What did this happen? What did it happen? Stop. It was an accident. Everything, everything afterwards, that's up what I did, but it was an accident. Instead of passing AJ's death off as a mercy killing, Candy Joe now says it was an accident. Okay. He said his back was hurting me. Had us be Xanax and muscle relaxers, and I gave them to him, but. It wasn't. I didn't drive him, and I didn't give him that ring. Excuse me, Marshall. I don't know. <laughs> when I came back, he wasn't. He was treated. No. When I asked Candy why did she tape AJ's mouth and wrists, she told me because she didn't want to look at his face when she was moving him, and taping his hands was the easiest way to move AJ. But investigators aren't buying it. In your mind, that made you think you kind of snapped that thing a little bit? No, it snapped that thing so That's what she snapped. It's just too many lies from the start of the investigation. I really didn't need to do it. And I know it looks so delicious. It's just horrible. Her 
A.J. Hardin sent a jolt through the tiny town of Fort Sumner, New Mexico. We didn't know where she was, what she was going to do, how was she going to act. So when she was caught, there was somewhat of a feeling of closure. Sean is in for another shock. Three days after the arrest, he gets a letter from Candy Jo. The letter stated that she didn't feel empathy for anyone, that she is just a psychopath, and that I need to protect my daughter from people like her. He turns the letter over to investigators. Prosecutors believe it's a ploy. Often you will see defendants do this because they're trying to set themselves up for the ability to have a defense of insanity. Confirming their suspicions, Candy Joe's attorneys request a psychological evaluation. They want to get her evaluated, and we were too close to trial, and they hadn't followed the rules, in my opinion, and I argued against it, and the judge agreed with me and said, no, we are going to trial. As they prepare for trial, prosecutors work with investigators to formulate what they believe happened when AJ was murdered. They determine that no one had seen AJ since Candy filed the no trespass order against Aaron on August 21st. The timeline that we built was more or less that August 21st weekend is where she probably killed him. Ultimately, she did drug him to the point where he passed out. She told us she was covering his mouth with duct tape. He might have still been breathing and she probably suffocated him at the time. At that point, she needed to get the body out of the residence. So at that point, she ended up taping up AJ's hands and she put him inside the, the tool chest, placed it on the trailer, and days later drove him out there and threw him in that pit. Tired of caring for her ailing grandfather, Candy Jo was looking for a fresh start. She hoped to get that by selling the lake house. Candy had been talking to realtors to try and put the house on the market. I think it was purposely done for monetary gain because she has a new boyfriend. They're gonna have a bank full of money, Agent Harden's money. I always thought that was a very sad deal. She was supposed to be taking care of him. You know, first degree murder. But about a week before they approached me about taking a second degree plea. And when I talked to the family members that were left, they didn't want her to go to jail at all. My understanding was she convinced them that this was an accident and they really believed her. So after talking with the family, and due to the fact that the body was so deteriorated, there was no way to determine whether it was an accident or whether it was intentional. So because of those facts, I decided to go ahead and accept the plea. On July 27th, 2022, Candy Joe pleads guilty to second degree murder, fraud, and tampering with evidence. So out of the 21 years possible, she received 18 of those. With good time, she may be out in 12 years. I don't feel that 12 years would be enough for someone that did something so atrocious. While the small town of Fort Sumner still reels from Candy Joe's cold-hearted actions, AJ's memory remains alive. AJ was a good, kind-hearted man that experienced 10 lives in his one lifetime. He deserved more than what he got. He's lost children, he's lost his wife, he's lost friends, but he maintained a happy and spiritual demeanor, as well as being a great, great grandfather to my daughter. Mississippi 
town, these two women were everything to each other. They grew out a close friendship. If you've seen one of them, you've seen both of them. In the early hours of one winter morning, their friendship goes up in smoke. We put a firefighter to the window. He found her between the foot of the bed and the wall. Investigators uncover a deadly betrayal that has been smoldering for years. This woman was supposed to be her best friend. She seemed to be looking after her. I don't really think she was doing anything other than watching out for her investment. And as a sinister plan is revealed, a sighting from beyond the grave cements suspicions. She had seen on the news where she had died. Then she was in Walmart shopping and saw her. As the truth unfolds, this small town may never be the same. Your past doesn't escape you. She didn't know what was coming when it did come. She was shocked. Twenty minutes south of Memphis, the town of Horn Lake, Mississippi, is generally a quiet place. But on Northwood Cove, in the early morning hours of December 19, 1994, the calm is suddenly broken. In the early morning hours, one of the neighbors said they heard an explosion, and they reported to the police. As the fire department approached, they found a structure that was fully involved. Neighbors are gathered outside the home that is now engulfed in flames. When we found out that the occupant of the house, which was Lily Young, they all had said that Ms. Lula was at home at the time, and they had not seen her come out. The members of the small town fire department know exactly who Miss Lula is. Lula Young, she was an EMT. She was known by a lot of people in Horn Lake. The emergency services people were real familiar with her because she rode the ambulance. A lot of the people that were there and, and trying to get the fire out knew her personally. It was a bad situation. The firefighters mobilize with one team fighting the blaze and the other trying to locate 47-year-old Lula Young. The fire was still going pretty good. We knew we was going to need a hose line and go to a bedroom window to the window with the hose line. We found her between the foot of the bed and the wall. She was unconscious. It appeared that she had gotten up and tried to get out and collapsed. Lula suffered first and second degree burns on her torso. It didn't appear that she was breathing, and our biggest concern was to get her away from the structure. When Lula was pulled from the fire, she never regained consciousness, and she uh, eventually died of smoke inhalation. They pronounced her dead at that point on the scene. Lula's friends and family are devastated. Everybody that knew Miss Young thought she was a good person. People were really sad that she had died. Good neighbor, Lula Young. It hurt. It's the biggest thing you can always say of a loss of a loved one in your life. But Lula was a, a thing that's hard to really process in your mind. Mike Melton and me that morning, we got up to go to him. And Mike Melton's wife called. He said, hey, Bubba. He said, uh, there had been a fire at your mom's house. And I said, is everything okay? And he looked at me and he shook his head no. That was not what I was anticipating. So you're saying mom's gone. Yeah, she's gone. Welch grew up in a large, close-knit family in Tunica, Mississippi. My mom was born down in central Mississippi. My grandfather was a farmer. My grandmother was a stay-at-home mom. Lula was born on October the 15th of 1947. She was the second child of what eventually became seven. Lula had a heart just <laughs> big as wheel, you know. Her biggest hobby was making other folks happy. After becoming one of the first in her family to graduate high school, Lula married her childhood sweetheart, John Young. 
When mom was a kid, her and my dad grew up together. They knew each other from back when they were, well, I'd say, 10 years old. My dad worked construction, so, you know, daddy was, you know, in this town today and that town tomorrow. In 1970, Lula learned she was pregnant. The birth of their son was followed a few years later by a daughter. Now a family of four, Lula and John settled in the small town of Horn Lake, Mississippi. My mom and dad were the Ozzy and Harriet of the South. I mean, mom stayed at home and took care of the house. Dad went off to work. When dad got home, dinner was on the table. While John worked hard doing construction to support the family, Lula who never met a stranger. Lula became especially close with her neighbor, Linda Leadham. Linda moved next door in 1978. She had two kids also. It was a, roughly about the same age as Lula's kids when they moved there. So they grew on a close friendship. Linda grew up just a few hours from Horn Lake in the small town of Selmer, Tennessee, and eventually moved to Memphis during her high school years. They had a lot of property and money that way, and Linda got to doing taxes. She did everybody's taxes, you know. Linda worked from home and cared for her children, Melanie and Jennifer, while her husband, Gary, worked as a truck driver. Linda was somebody that mom confided in. Linda and Luda was two people. If you've seen one of them, you've seen both of them. When Lula's 15-year marriage to John came to an end, the two friends became even closer. Mom came down, and she just broke the news. You know, Dad was home one day, and he was gone the next. Her and my dad divorced. That was it. As Lula settled into her new life as a single mom, Linda stuck by her friend's side. It was a wake-up call. You know, I mean, when mom having to put money back to pay the light bill at the end of the month. With Linda's support, Lula came up with a plan to get back on her feet. Linda had been taking courses to become a nurse. She told mom that she could make good money being a nurse. And so mom was working as a LPN and she got a raise to go work as a medical transcriber, and she was happy with that. In 1988, Lula also began volunteering with the Horn Lake Fire Department. When I turned 18, I was able to join the fire department. We needed somebody to do the book work, and she joined the fire department to be the bookkeeper and accounting firm for the fire department. And later, my mom went and she got her EMT license. But in the late 1980s, 40-year-old Lula was dealt a major setback. Mom was diagnosed with cancer in either 87 or 88. She had developed breast cancer, and she had to take a series of chemo and radiation treatments. But Lula did find out she had the cancer. It really got her down mentally for a while. But then again, she had the idea, I could beat this. I was devastated because of the fact that she would just, you know, be sick. It was just terrible. I couldn't fathom having to go through that. Linda immediately stepped in to help. Nobody had looked after her the way her friend Linda Leadham had looked after her. Linda would go buy groceries for her, bring them to the house to her. Linda was a super friend to her. Lula endured grueling treatment. But after six years, she came out the other side cancer-free. She found out she was in remission. It was a real uplift to her because she felt like she had to beat it. She, she said all the time, I can beat it. She felt like she had. I asked her one time, yes, did you regret anything? She said, nothing. I mean, she lived every day like it was the last one she had. Tragically, Lula's second chance didn't last long. On December 19, 1994, her hopes and dreams go up in smoke. We worked on the fire probably a good 25 to 30 minutes before we were able to bring it under control and knock it down. 
investigators inspect the remains of the house, questions begin to arise. When firefighters entered the home on December the 19th, they observed a heater close to the front door. Near the heater, investigators find another unusual object among the ashes. There was a propane bottle inside the home. Not many people store propane bottles inside their home. When investigators take a closer look at the propane tank, their suspicions grow. The valve had been turned and left cracked. That means your gas is coming out. So that put a key indicator right there. There is something strange going on. They thought it might be said intentionally, but there was only one person in the home. That was Lily Young. In my opinion, it wasn't just an accidental fire. Coming up, a witness claims to have seen a ghost. She said the person that she knew as Miss Lily Young was walking in the store. And points the investigation in a new direction. He said Lola had asked her to do this. December 19th, 1994. A house fire in Horn Lake, Mississippi, has taken the life of cancer survivor and beloved community member, 47-year-old, who believe the blaze was no accident. Propane bottles, like you use for your gas grill, are not normally kept inside the home. There was also a, a electric heater that was in close proximity to that tank. There was just several things that didn't add up. All of this, in my mind, at that point, pointed that it wasn't just an accidental fire. For the time being, investigators decide to keep their suspicions to themselves. I like to keep a lot of this hidden from the public in the very beginning of it because you never know who's listening. There is one thing they can't keep under wraps the news of Lula's death. One of the persons that had come up on the scene was Miss Linda Leon. She openly said that she was the best friend of Miss Young and how devastating this was. Linda tells investigators that she was home with her family when she heard about the fire. She said her neighbor had called. Miss Leon told her about the fire because she was her best friend. struggles to accept the news. We got the phone call that morning at breakfast that Lula had passed away. It was down hard for all of us. Of course, we all had a lot of questions. The term that we got was that the house had literally exploded. So I was trying to figure out how the house could blow up. Nothing in the house was gas. So how could the house explode? Investigators have yet to re they found a propane tank in Lula's house. Investigators are usually pretty close to the chest on information they share, so when they do get a suspect, they can evaluate the evidence or this statement based on what's being said. Those who knew Lula are shocked that the trained first responder would have any fire hazards inside her home. She was scared of fire. That was her biggest fear. Everybody said, well, she was pretty careful. She wouldn't do something dumb. Later that same day, investigators get the results of Lula's autopsy report. Lula's cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning. Basically, she died of smoke inhalation. I knew the coroner very well, and uh, he had ruled this as, as an accidental death. However, there is one detail from the autopsy that gives investigators pause. They found some sleeping pills in the autopsy. One has to wonder, did Lila take these herself and actually set the fire herself? Or did someone give them to her? The amount of medication was not fatal, but investigators must consider if the pills were meant to keep Lula asleep and unable to escape the raging fire. Lula had been in Horn Lake for a while. It's a fairly close 
talking with her neighbors and people that, that uh, knew her, that she's now in remission. Absolutely no way that suicide would ever been a factor. She wasn't depressed at all. There was a lady that was looking forward to life the next day. At this point, investigators aren't sure about the sleeping pills or even if this is arson, but there are enough red flags uh, to keep the investigation open. Investigators continue speaking to neighbors, but make little headway until just a few days later when they receive a call from an insurance agent, Brenda Driver. The agent explains that she'd sold Lula a policy just four months earlier. She had seen on the news where Lula had died in the fire. But that's not why Brenda's calling. She says that not long after the fire, she had the shock of a lifetime while grocery shopping. Within two weeks after the fire, Brenda Driver was in Walmart shopping and saw who she thought to be Lula Young, the person she sold the policy to. She said she went home and told her husband she'd seen a dead woman walking because she had these papers saying this lady's dead and I'm looking at her in the face, you know. Brenda Driver attempts to contact Lula Young the uh, number she has for Lula Young. Linda Latham answers the phone, identifies herself as Linda Latham and Lula's sister, and confirms she's dead. Investigators immediately bring Brenda in for an interview. Ms. Driver reported the fact that she had been to Ms. Lula's house and sold a policy to Ms. Lula for interest, and that it also named Ms. Uh, Linda Latham as the beneficiary of that. Ms. Lula Young had told Brenda Driver that they basically were sisters. And that's the reason that Linda Lidham was uh, given the beneficiary part of it. The total amount of policies were approximately $700,000. Policies were so big that they required a physical. With their suspicions raised, investigators wonder, is it possible that Linda Lidham could have posed as Lula? That is the lady. Law enforcement also found a nurse that actually performed the physical. Showing photographs of Linda Lake to the nurse who conducted the exam. Investigators were able to determine that Linda Latham was the one that actually posed as Lola Young and took the medical exams. Instead of pulling Linda in for interview, investigators opt to build their case by talking to those who know her best. We were building up with the case that we had. You talk to friends, you talk to family members. That's the easiest way that you find out information on somebody. Investigators quickly learn that Linda's insurance scam wasn't exactly a secret. However, Linda claimed that Lula was in on it. Linda says to people, Lulu had asked her to do this and asked her to take the medical exams because she had cancer and she knew she could not complete those exams and, and obtain those policies for that value. Linda was supposed to be taking care of the kids. That was Lulu's wishes. But Lula's family isn't buying it. Lula never said anything about an insurance policy that she'd taken out for anybody. The DA sent it to the family to let them handle the insurance fraud, the mail fraud, so that there would be no chance of double jeopardy in state court if he was ever able to prove that Linda was involved. While federal authorities take over the fraud case, investigators refocus their attention on Lula's death. At this point in time, I do believe Linda Leon was involved. We found that Ms. Leon had a by the fact that she was at home at the time of the fire. We knew it was arson, but trying to prove arson in a lot of times are, is hard to do because it's hard to get to the person that actually set the fire. Coming up, the investigation falls into peril. We got a leak of information being given to a particular person. They were feeding information to her. Investigators make a bold move to uncover the truth. There's 
state investigators were sitting in the other room listening on a body wire. Investigating the fire that took the Linda Leadham stood to gain over seven hundred thousand dollars in insurance payouts. Linda was her best friend, and she said Willie Young wanted Linda to take care of her kids. The intention was to defraud the insurance company about the cancer, and for Linda to take care of her kids with that money. While federal authorities dig into the insurance fraud. Local investigators continue looking for proof that Linda is behind Lula's murder. We knew it was arson. We just didn't know who had set the fire. Months pass with no new leads. However, they do learn that Linda Leadham has been keeping close tabs on the investigation. Ms. Leadham had two people that was a good friend of hers also. One happened to be a dispatcher, and they were feeding information to her. Ms. Leadham was getting information about as fast as we were. To stop the leak, investigators take an unusual step. They released false information to the public about an extension cord being the cause of the fire to try to get the person who did set the fire to relax and not be worried about it. I wanted her to feel like, hey, everything's cool. I ain't got nothing to worry about. Although no arson or murder charges have been filed, Linda remains under investigation for insurance fraud. Early on, investigators had contacted the insurance companies and advised them not to pay on the policies. One of the policies still paid two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars before the investigation stopped payment of the rest of it i never saw any of that money i didn't know anything about the payouts or the money or the reasons behind all of this when it was all said and done linda used the money to purchase numerous rental houses while linda appears to have no intention of making good on her promise to care for lula's kids that doesn't prove she's a killer For the next two years, investigators continue to question anyone familiar with Lula and Linda. Until 1997, when they finally get the break they've been waiting for. This informant approached an officer that, that he had a trusting, real good relationship with and confided in him. He started talking about Ms. Lula and her involvement. On January 16th, 1997, investigators sit down. He confided that Linda had actually approached him on two different occasions, asking him to basically kill Lula as a mercy killing. She had cancer, she was dying. When Robbie declined, Linda asked him for advice. He was friends with several police officers, so she asked him uh, about how to burn a house down without getting caught. He didn't go to the authorities at that time because he didn't think she was going to really go through with it. I don't think he thought Linda was capable of actually doing it. Robbie's statement comes close to confirming investigators' suspicions about Linda, but they will need more. Robbie is willing to help. He agrees to wear a wire and meet up with Linda. They began trying to use him to go in and speak to Linda and try to get her to confess. I don't know how many times they sent Robbie in to talk to Linda, you know, trying to get her to say on tape that she had been the one to do it. She didn't confess. They just never got what they wanted. Investigators fear the case is once again in danger of stalling out. Until a second informant named David Vincent comes forward two weeks after the first tip from Robbie. David Vincent was trying to get a lighter sentence. He was in jail himself. He wanted help on his charges. 
on February the 3rd, 1997, I went in to talk to the informant in jail. David tells them that he has information about Lula's death, information he got from his former landscaper, Charles Wayne Dunn. They'd been working together, Dunn had confided in him one day that he did something that he regretted. Charles Wayne Dunn told David Benson that he had killed Lula Young and that Lila Latham had paid him to do it. At this point, David reveals a detail investigators have long suspected but never made public. Charles Wayne Dunn told David Benson that he had to make it look like an accident because if she died from cancer, the policies may not pay. When he was telling the story, what was running through my head is, we got her. I mean, this is the break we've been looking for if he's telling the truth. The next step for me is to try to substantiate what David Benson is telling us. And so I did a little research on Dunn and found out that he was on probation. Investigators find information connecting him to Linda. Linda Leedham was listed as his employer and person to contact in case of emergency. Confident that they are on the right track, investigators set up a sting. I devised a plan with his probation officer to have Dunn come into the probation office for a meeting. And they got David Vincent out and wired him and had him report like he would just been put on probation. And I had them sit in the lobby together like they're waiting to see their probation officer. With the wire live, David acts surprised to see his former co-worker and friend. We had him ease into the conversation and then get into what Dunn had told him in the past. David Vincent had said that he was thinking about killing somebody and that's the way he got the conversation started. Dunn's response when Vincent's asking him about the situation was, you should think about it, your past doesn't escape you. The irony of that, his past wasn't escaping. There's state investigators sitting in the other room listening on a body fire. And Vincent just said, hey, you remember the time you told me you killed this woman? While Dunn didn't come out and say exactly what I hoped he would say, he didn't deny it at all. At this point, I felt like that I was ready to actually talk to Dunn myself. Coming up, face to face with a suspected killer, investigators drill down for the truth. Chris told him, you know why you're here and so do we. And a disturbing picture begins to take shape. This was not the only time he had set a fire for Linda Latham. After Lula Young is killed in a house fire, Mississippi authorities are eager to talk to Charles Wayne Dunn, following incriminating statements made during a wiretap. On February 20th of 1997, Chris Seeley and I went to Wayne Dunn's residence, and when we got there, Wayne goes, I've been inspecting y'all. Dunn accompanies them back to the DA's office for an interview. I began interviewing Dunn and, and was going through some preliminary background stuff. He was nervous and uptight and kind of panicky. Chris told him, you know why you're here and so do we. Finally, he started his confession. Uh, in 1993, when she hired him to do some work around her house. Dunn was a handyman. He went over and did stuff for her. Charles Wayne Dunn was also friends with Linda. And he says in 1994, Linda came to him with a dangerous proposition. He said, Linda, she confronted him. She would give him $5,000 to kill Lula because Lula was suffering because she had cancer. She told Wayne Dunn that she was going to die anyway, so why not take advantage of it? Ultimately, Dunn confessed that he was the one that set the fire. We got an arrest warrant that night, and one of us booked him into jail. After Dunn confesses to the things, we, of course, would like to try to substantiate what he's telling us as much as we can by 
trying to get him to talk to the London where nobody was. The following day, investigators put their third and hopefully final sting into action. They wire him up and send him in to talk to Linda under the pretense that he's feeling bad about it. Linda didn't say the things we would like for her to have said, but she didn't say anything that indicated that he was innocent either. And to the contrary, she wound up giving him like $200, I think, to leave town. After failing to get the confession they need to make an arrest, Dunn returns to investigators who press him for more details of the murder. In Dunn's original confession, he left out the, the part about the propane tank and so forth. Dunn says on December 18, 1994, he went to Lula's house for a visit. Dunn went over just to act like he was coming by to visit with her because she was familiar with him. Dunn brought a propane tank Linda had asked Lula to keep for her. Dunn said he'd given her medicine to make her fall asleep so that she wouldn't suffer during the fire. He waited on her to go to sleep before he set the fire. He talked about cracking the valve on the propane and he put newspaper down in front of the propane heater. He turned the heater on and walked out the door and left. Once the heater come on, he ignited the paper. The gas was already there for the paper to ignite it, and that's when you get the big explosion. He was telling us enough about it that wasn't public information. He told it in a way that that you got the faith. He's, he's telling you the truth, or he did it himself. Wayne Dunn drops one more bombshell, one that investigators do not see coming. One of the things that Dunn told us about when we were interviewing him was that this was not the only time he had set a fire for Linda Latham. There happened to be a fire that was set on a house that was in South Haven, and that house belonged to the Miss Latham daughter. It was two years after the initial fire in Miss Lula's house. They just evidently decided the best thing to do is set it on fire and then get that insurance money also. Investigators are stunned. Leonard Latham has gone from this person that everybody knew and liked to this basically criminal mastermind. We felt like we had enough after talking with Dunn and doing the body fire with Dunn that we could go to a grand jury to try to move forward with the case. On March 11, 1997, three years after Lula's death, the grand jury indicts Linda Leadham, and authorities move forward with an arrest that same day. The initial warrants for Linda Leadham were capital murder, conspiracy to commit capital murder, three counts of forgery, conspiracy to commit arson, arson, and three counts of fraud. She acted like she was in shock. And if I remember correctly, she goes, what's this about? Following her arrest, investigators execute a search warrant at Linda's home. One of the things that we found in the search warrant was several hundred thousand dollars worth of insurance on a, another individual. The gentleman by the name of Robert Stovall, and we found out that she was trying to make arrangements to whereby they was going to do him in also, just like they did Miss Young for insurance purposes. I found all these insurance policies on Robert Stovall with Linda Leadham being the beneficiary, and we discovered Stovall was a individual that Linda Leadham's mother oversaw his financial dealings and so forth. This really brought a red flag to me because in my case, Against Dunn, I had interviewed his friend who said he had actually been asked to help Dunn kill another individual. And, and at the time, I didn't give it much stock. Kind of felt like one of those deals where, oh, he's just trying to be important in the case and so forth. But then when I found these insurance policies, a little bell went off in my head and said, this is who he's talking about. She already had talked to somebody to actually uh, take care of Robert as far as uh, taking him out. Plot. 
They find Robert Stovall alive and well. When Stovall was interviewed, he didn't even know who Linda Latham was. Once she did it with Lola on the insurance stuff, I think she saw that opportunity with the Stovall situation too. Coming up, Lola's loved ones worry that her killer may escape justice. She was doing what Lola wanted, entertaining those policies fraudulently. She said there. Probably felt like money will buy me out of this also. By the spring of 1997, Linda Leadham is in custody awaiting trial. Almost three years after the murder of her best friend, Lula Young. While Lula was battling cancer, the woman she thought was her best friend was plotting her death. Linda is planning on killing somebody who's sick to begin with for money. She seemed to be looking after Miss Young. I don't really think she was doing anything other than watching out for her investment. It was extremely cold. Extremely cold. In August 1999, Linda stands trial. Linda, of course, did not plead guilty and went to trial, and uh, we tried her for capital murder. Prosecutors paint Linda as a greedy woman who plotted Lula's murder for financial gain. The story that we were trying to show was just how manipulative and evil she was. I mean, this woman was supposed to be her best friend. My insurance, wait them to go into effect, go take physicals and do it. I mean, this is not something I sign on Tuesday and I go do on Wednesday and we take care of it on Thursday. I mean, no, this is a month, month, month long process. The prosecution's star witness bolsters their claims. In Linda's murder trial, Charles Wayne Dunn uh, took the stand and uh, told of his involvement in the murder of Lily Young, and he also told of Linda Latham's involvement. Linda's defense was she was doing what Lula wanted, entertaining those policies fraudulently. The plan was for her to be the recipient of the money because the kids couldn't supposedly handle the money. As the trial unfolds, Linda's lack of emotions... ...and what's going down, but uh, totally unmoved by in all of her life, if anything ever had went wrong with her, money bought her out of it. And I think in her heart, she probably felt like money will buy me out of this also. After a brief deliberation, the jury returns a verdict. Linda was found guilty on all counts. When Linda was found guilty at the trial, the judge looked her in the face and the words he told her, you never deserved streets of Mississippi again, and I'll see that you don't. A year of life in prison with no possibility for parole. Though Linda is safely behind bars, the legacy of her cold-hearted plot lingers in Horn Lake. Linda Leadham was the greediest, selfish, cold-heartedest person that I ever met. Linda Leadham is exactly where she needs to be. She took of a lady that was already fighting cancer. A lady that was well known in the community, a volunteer that helped anybody, and to do her that way, all for the one thing, money. It's so cold hearted. It's just hard to fathom. What I never understood though is how you could go from friendship to to that. You know, it just that's the part I never understood. My mom looked in the good of everyone. My mom tried to help anyone that she can with whatever she could. <laughs>